Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our time of fellowship and time of uh, worshiping the Lord. And uh, we gather together in his name. Today is going to be Trinity Sunday. And believe it or not, we, in, we enter into this longest season of the church year today. And everything is supposed to be green. And of course, when you look outside, everything is. This is my favorite song. And she goes, well, let's sing it next Sunday. And here it is, Trinity Sunday. And it's perfect. You all know it. So if you want to sing along, it's in your green book on page 27. And it's a beautiful way to praise the Lord. Then God said, let us, now God is saying this to himself, let us make man in our own image after our likeness. That our, that us, that's a plural word. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So, verse 27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. 
But let us make manna in our image. Let's uh, pray. Father, we come before you and we thank you for these words. We pray your blessing upon them. The thought that we have of this triune God, the Trinity God. I, I, I bow before you. I thank you for what you have revealed in your scripture about yourself. Gracious God, bless our thoughts today. Bless the meditations of all of our hearts. And may they truly be acceptable in your sight. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I, I, as I've already shared with you, there are some very difficult concepts in Scripture. They are very hard sometimes. There's some of the things about Scripture that we just have a hard time understanding and a hard time even comprehending. And one of those basically difficult things is the concept of God. You know, it often happens to me when I'm dealing with young people and, uh, and sometimes even with my confirmation students, they will come and ask a very serious question. And I think it is a serious question. And here it is. When was God born? When was God born? And you know, it's really uh, sometimes difficult to get these confirmation students or these young people to, to come understand the, the fact that there's no way that we will ever understand that God has never been born. He has always existed. Our mind does not wrap around that at all. In our text today, there is no explanation for who God is. It just simply says, in the beginning, God. Very plainly, he is there. He tells us that there are three. And we're going to find out that a little bit even today. Uh, in the beginning, God. Before anything was, there was God. I don't think that we can with these finite brains even begin to understand that God has always been. Always. You know, another difficult uh, concept to comprehend is the concept of eternity. We know that while we're here on this earth, our body will grow old and it will die. But when we enter into God's eternal heaven, the Bible makes it plain that we will never die, we'll never have any sin, we'll never have any disease, we'll never even have to sleep, which I think is great. <laughs> For as Christians, this is our, our hope. That we're going to be entering into a relationship with God and into His heaven, His kingdom, that will be for eternity. That's hard sometimes to understand. But that's the hope of us as Christians, whereas the world thinks this is nothing but pie in the sky by and by when we die, you know. But there's another concept that is seemingly impossible for us to grasp is the concept of infinity. If we are finite in our bodies, we are there also in our minds and in our emotions. We're limited by time, space, and dimension. We think in a three-dimensional world with height and depth. But that's what we think when we think of our world. But I want you to imagine that God is not finite. He's infinite. He's infinite. We occupy one little space in time. But God is omnipotent, omniscient, and everywhere present. Now, what does that mean? Omnipotent means that he's all-powerful. He's almighty. We call him that, the almighty heavenly father. He's omniscient. omniscient. That means he knows everything. He knows when you sit down, when you rise up, he knows your thoughts from afar. He knows everything about you because he's God. And he's omnipresent. Honestly, I can't tell. I can't figure it out how in the world he can live in me with his, with his fullness and still live in you with his fullness as well. 
How does he do that? And how, when we are gathered together, two or three of us in his name, gathered together to worship him, he says, I'm right there in the midst of you. And the people that are across the world that have gathered in his name, he's right there with them too. You see, this is God. There's some things about God that we will never be able to understand. I don't know if you heard just recently that they've got a new telescope, not the Hubble, but they've got a new telescope that they're putting up in the space. And they're going to be, see, be able to see that much further than the Hubble because they are so desperately trying to find out where is the end of all of this. And guess what they're going to find out? There is no end. There is no end. I... Uh, uh, told my kids in confirmation that uh, you know when we look up at the sky and it's blue it's beautiful is that a blue wall out there is that a blue wall out there that we're looking at and if it is a wall what's on the other side of the wall you see that's God that's how awesome our God really is but what we want to deal with today is another one of these very difficult concepts within the scripture. The Bible makes it very plain that when we speak of God, we speak of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. These are not three gods. They are one God in three persons. The Trinity has been a difficult doctrine for, for so many for so long because how can you add one plus one plus one and end up with one? We know that that is isn't the way it's supposed to work. Well, that's what it is with God. The Athanasian Creed, which is one of the creeds that we as a church hold on to, says this, the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, and yet there are not three gods, but one God. The Father was neither made, nor created, nor begotten by anybody. The Son was not made or created, but was begotten by the Father. The Holy Spirit was not made or created or begotten, but proceeds from the Father and the Son. And among these three persons, none is before or after another, none is greater or less than another, but all three persons are co-equal, co-eternal, and accordingly, as it has been stated above, three persons are to be worshipped in one Godhead, and one God is to be worshipped in three persons. Now, Putting it to you very bluntly, it goes on to say this. Whoever wishes to be saved must think thus about the Trinity. That's a pretty powerful statement. If you're going to have a right relationship with God, you better be thinking right about the Trinity. Now, the word Trinity does not appear in the Bible. Yet there are a lot of places in the Old Testament that indicates how God works in three different ways, three different persons within people's lives. We know that God, in three persons, created all things. Psalm 33 and verse 8 says, For he, God, spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. Now we, we mainly recognize God the Father because that was his relationship to the children of Israel in the Old Testament. He wanted to be called their father. And they wanted to, he wanted them to refer to him as that. And that's why we call him father as well. We know that, uh, that he also wanted to be referred to as Israel's husband in many of the books of the Old Testament. We recognize God as father. But we also recognize in the Old Testament, God as Son. At various times, like when God walked with, God, uh, with Adam and Eve in the garden, that was Jesus who walked with Adam and Eve. Or when Abraham met with this, what they called the angel of the Lord, that was Jesus just before he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. You remember Jacob? He wrestled with somebody. He wrestled with Jesus while he was coming to grips with who God was. There are so many different times that we look at this. Uh, these are called Christophanies, where we find Jesus revealing himself in the Old Testament. 
God the Father is very plain in the Old Testament, but so was Jesus. They were called Christophanes. And of course, we begin with the Spirit. You see how the Spirit was working in the Old Testament. If you take a look at verse 2 of the very first chapter of the book of Genesis. Because after everything had taken place, we see that the earth was null and void. It was empty. And what does it say? That the Spirit brooded over the waters. That's what it says in verse 2 of our text. Verse 2. It says, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over over the face of the water. Now we see this continually in Je Genesis chapter 6 and verse 3. Just before the flood, God said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever because he is flesh and his days will be 120 years. We know that the spirit was active even just before the flood. In Exodus 31 and verse 33, verse 3, it says very plainly that there was a man that God had chosen to help build the tabernacle. And I like what it says in verse uh, chapter 31 and verse 3. He says, uh, And I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom, understanding, knowledge, and workmanship. I've filled him with the Spirit. So the Spirit was active even there. In the, no, we see all three working in the Old Testament. But... When it comes to the Trinity, we got to go to the New Testament. Because the Trinity makes, I mean, the New Testament makes it very clear what's going on in this doctrine of the Trinity. If you take a look at Galatians in chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, this is what it says. But when the fullness of time was come, now get a hold of that, would you? God has held back some wisdom held back some knowledge from the people on this earth until this time in the New Testament when Jesus came. And so he says, when the fullness of time came, when just at the right time, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law to redeem them that are under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Allah, Father. Here we find God sending forth the son and then the spirit coming to draw us even closer. So, in the few minutes that I have here, what is the work of the Holy Spirit? What is the work of the triune God? This is a very important part, especially when it comes to his business of being the father. Now, we think of the Father as being the creator of all the solar systems of the earth and all the things that are upon it, and even the creator of mankind. But actually, according to Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16, speaking about Jesus, it says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether they're thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him, that is Jesus. All things were created by Jesus and for Jesus. Now we have a tendency to think that the Father is the one that did all the creating. And we refer to him as his work. That is his work, creation. But when we say Father, we must remember that the name Father comes from a personal relationship that God wants to have with his children. We need to understand his work in the New Testament was in that process of trying to grab, uh, get a relationship with the people on the earth. Not according to the law, but rather just to draw them onto himself. I remember in Luke chapter 1, verse 35, Mary asked that question to the angel who came and told her that she was going to give birth to Jesus. And she said, how will this be since I'm a virgin? And he said, the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High, that's the Heavenly Father, the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And that's God doing a specific work of 
presenting to her the fact that she's going to give birth to Jesus, the Savior of the world, but the Father is doing this so that what? He can draw you into a right relationship with himself. You see, that's a very key thing. The work that the Father does in each one of our hearts is found in John chapter 6 and verse 44. And if you don't have this one underlined, you should. John 6, 44. It says, Jesus says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. That's his job, is to draw you unto himself. For this is a good and acceptable thing in the sight of God our Savior, 1 Timothy 2. Who would have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth? God the Father doesn't want anyone to perish. None of us to perish. And so he is constantly calling and drawing you onto himself. That's the word. Constantly drawing us on himself because of what his son accomplished on the cross. That's the work of the Father. That's the first member of the Trinity. But there's also the second member of the Trinity, and I probably don't even need to go over this because you know this, but the second person of the Trinity is Jesus Christ, the one who gave up his glory for a time to take on the form of a human being. It was Jesus who paid the price for our salvation. It was His body and His blood that was given so that we might have the opportunity to have our sins forgiven. When the Father draws us, He looks at Jesus and says, You paid for their sins. You paid the ransom with His body and with His blood so that we might have our sins forgiven, that we might gain life, and salvation. It's only through that sacrifice that the Father can even begin to draw us unto Himself. Now I realize there were many other things that Jesus did while He was on this earth. I know that He came for the purpose of trying to straighten out some of the people's thinking about who God really is. Uh, he, he wanted to share about His grace and share His mercy. There were a lot of things that Jesus did. He taught us how to live a righteous life while He was here. But His main and important focus was to get to that cross. To give his body and to give his blood so that it would ransom sinners like you and I. But then there is the third member of the Trinity and that is the member we call the Holy Spirit. And according to the Word of God, the Holy Spirit does one of the very first things that he does is he tries to convict us of our sin. Oh, why does he have to do that? Why does he have to do that? We all know we're sinners, right? We all know we're sinners. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It says in, in Romans 3.10, there's none righteous, none. We all know that we are sinners. But the first thing that the Holy Spirit does is he begins to convict us of our sin. And the reason why he says that he wants to convict us of our sin is because in our minds, we need to know that our sin is separating us from God. Our sin has, has literally turned us away from God. And the only way that we will ever know that we are saved is when we first of all recognize that we are sinners. Because only sinners realize they need a Savior. Only sinners. And so the Holy Spirit, the first thing that He wants to do is He wants to convict us of our sins. The Spirit's job is to do just that. And then immediately after He convicts us of our sins and we feel this awful weight of burden and shame and guilt, He then points us to Jesus. And He says, but Jesus is here. And He has paid the price for your sins. And that's when He, as He points us to Jesus, that we can have the hope 
of eternal life. But we also know that the Holy Spirit leads us to living a righteous life before God. It is His desire to give us the power and the strength and the will to live righteously here on this earth. Now we call this work of the Holy Spirit the work of sanctification. Will we ever find perfection while we're here on this earth? Of course not. Of course not. But the Holy Spirit will always be trying to set you apart from the world to live righteously before God. That's why the Holy Spirit comes to your conscience. That's why He comes to your heart. And why He says, hey, is this really what we should be doing? Does this really please the Lord? Oh, we see, we need all three works of God within our hearts. The Heavenly Father drawing us onto Himself. The, the person of Jesus who has redeemed us done that which was necessary to redeem us. And then we have this third member of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, that calls us through the Gospel, enlightens us with His gifts. He sanctifies and preserves us in the true faith. Now, I'm going to tell you, I'm not telling you anything that you probably don't know already. But this is basic Christianity 101. That's what this is. Basic Christianity 101. Because if you don't believe these things that I've shared with you today out of the Word of God, then you really can't be saved. And to really know what it means to have a relationship with God. You see, God is our Savior. And it is these things that speak to us of His grace and His mercy. And most of all, his love for us as lost sinners on this earth. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. And that's what the triune God is continuing to try to do to us. Even as Christians, as believers, He's trying to draw us into a much tighter relationship with Himself. Are there things that you just don't understand about God? Yeah, there's a lot of things that are very hard to understand. But my friends, that's where faith comes in. Do we fully understand what takes place in a little child's heart at baptism? Probably not. But we believe it by faith. Do we understand when we take communion what really takes place in our hearts when we take communion. Well, we may not fully understand. That's what faith is all about. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. No, we haven't seen God. And I'll let you out, not too many of you have seen angels around. But we believe what God has said in His Word and we are brought into a right relationship with Him because we place our faith in Him. For by grace, God's grace, are you saved through faith. It's not of yourself. It is the gift of God. Wow. That's a wonderful gift, isn't it? It's a marvelous gift that God has given to us. Yes, there are things that we don't know or we can't uh, uh, understand, can't comprehend, but there is one thing you need to know more than anything else, that God is going to do whatever it takes to draw you onto Himself. And He does not desire that anyone should perish, but that all would come to the knowledge of the truth. The truth is that we have a God who loves us. And we have a God who works on us in three different ways so that he can have a relationship to you and I that will last for all eternity. I'll tell you, I am grateful for the triune God. And I'm grateful that I have placed my faith not in anything I can do, but to 
placed my faith in who he is and what he has done for me. My prayer is that you have done the same thing. My prayer is that you believe in the triune of God. Amen? Amen. Amen? Father, thank you for this uh, basic course on Christianity and what you have called us to believe and what you called us to do. I thank you, God. I thank you, God, for your Son, Jesus Christ. I thank you, God, for your Spirit that moves us. I thank you, Father, for that loving relationship you desire to have with us. Thank you, Lord. To you be all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen, amen. Let's, uh, let's turn to one more hymn before we close our service here today. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling calling for you and for me. Let's stand together as we sing. Softly and tenderly Jesus is calling